Welcome to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Podcast, episode 98. Welcome to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Podcast with your host, Jack Mountain Bushcraft School founder and master main guide, Tim Smith. I'm your host, Tim Smith. I'm a registered master main guide and have been a full-time outdoor instructor and guide since founding the Jack Mountain Bushcraft School in 1999. We help people become more skilled, more knowledgeable, more experienced, and more confident in the natural world through our bushcraft and guide training semester programs and multi-week canoe and snowshoe expeditions. You can check out the show notes to all of our podcasts at blog.jackmtn.com. If you're interested in learning more about our college-accredited and GI Bill-approved programs, visit the Jack Mountain Bushcraft School on the web at jackmtn.com. And check out our online network and digital learning academy at bushcraftschool.com. Hello and welcome back to the Jack Mountain Bushcraft Podcast. It is a rainy Friday here, uh, but we are... Having fun, 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 fun. (laughs) In the communications layer of our semi-sub... Communications level of the semi-subterranean North Main Woods layer here. Looking out at the... uh, Looking out the window at all the rain coming down. So we had an epic drought here in northern Maine this year. Last week, we had, uh, I think, an inch and a half of rain. Today and tomorrow, we're getting two inches of rain. So to put it in perspective, the Aroostook River several days ago was at 28 cubic feet per second. It's at like 1,200 now. And when we get this next batch of rain, the ground's all saturated. We're going to go right from drought to flood in just a few days. And, And that's how we like it. Yeah, I've been building an arc. Yeah. In preparation. Good for you. I haven't even convinced the dog to get in it, but uh-huh. I've been hanging out in there. Yeah. That's I'm that ready. pile of like scrap lumber with the nails, the yeah. rusty nails sticking out all yeah. over the place. I build good. Is that with the screen door on the bottom? I build good. <laughs> <laughs> our topic for today, we are going to talk about our process for developing wilderness instructors and guides. So kind of the end result of someone who goes through our program Um, looking for professional training and the steps that we advise they take in order to get there. So if you're a Jack Mountain student, maybe you've heard this before. And if you're not and you never plan to come out here, maybe this will be helpful in designing your own uh, learning at home program. Right? Right. Right. So uh, Christopher and I, and we're welcoming B to the podcast. He was was on the, the most recent one. Um, but now it's it's a more intimate setting here in the communications level. And uh, wow. uh, <laughs> welcome, B. Yeah. What <laughs> a lead in. Bow, bow. Yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first syllable uttered on the podcast. That's good. Well. You're off to a good start. Done. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's just jump right yeah, into it, I guess. It. No let's current events, no nothing. No. So I am fully of the belief that we train the best outdoor leaders, outdoor instructors and guides in the industry. Um, And I think it's easy, first of all, lots of places make that claim, right? And it's easy to hear that and think that it's sort of a like a like a bravado, chest thumping, hey, you know, we're number one, we're number one, something kind of stupid like that. And and that's really not uh, what I'm trying to communicate when I say that, that, you know, we train the the best in the industry. Um, What I mean by that more so is that people when they successfully complete our training program get a journeyman certification like they've got probably more hours invested than maybe through any other program in the outdoor industry and as a result of all the hours invested that's where my confidence in saying that that you know they're the best trained and the most capable comes from yeah i would also add that it's um we also kind of provide people the most well-rounded approach to working in the industry. So it's not um, it's not just about like learning and showing off the skills. You also get the insight into the soft skills that people are working on, as well as, um, you know, once people are kind of brought into the fold, as it were, we, we help them with the business side of it, too, which most of the most people, most people in this industry kind of forget about or don't want to do. Um, you know, what I told this story before, but when I kind of started working for Tim, um, that started with a conversation about starting to run School of the Forest. And at the time I was planning on going and working for like Outward Bound or something similar like that. 
big and big corporate big, outdoor big corporate program. outdoor thing. And what he told me was they won't pay you enough to make co- enough to buy coffee. Um, but if you do a lot of the back end work yourself, that's where you can actually like make a living doing this thing that you love. And I think that that's um, there's something to that. You know, if you are just an instructor for some place and working, you know, every other weekend or something like that, like you're not you're not doing much for that organization. So why would they pay you more than they had to? But if if you're up here as part of our team, like you are doing, you're 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 doing every aspect of the business side of it. And I think that 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 means that our students are much better prepared for this industry than I think most of the people that want to work as guides. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Do you disagree? No, I don't disagree. Uh, You know, the the problem with an outdoor career is that it's a quote unquote cool job. Yeah. People line up to to do cool jobs um and as a result of having lots of people that want to do that that the people that pay you know uh introductory level cool jobs can afford to make pay very little yeah and they still have people lining up to do it right so we don't have that issue here like at the jack mountain bushcraft school we have a very small instructional team and, and office team and and it's like that you know by design um because very few people kind of meet the the uh, are willing to put up with all of the hassles uh, yeah. Yeah. for this sort of lifestyle. I say that sort of jokingly, but you know this is a very low tech but super high skill operation. So people, in order to be effective at working with us, they have to be very skilled, obviously in the physical skills, uh, in guiding, you know, canoeing, snowshoeing, all of those things have to be able to do all the crafts. And that's where, you know, we have our journeyman certification, which is kind of the first step in the wilderness instructor development process. So we kind of wrote up a bunch of stages for this, for those of you who are super interested in to maybe hang your shingle as an outdoor instructor or guide. And the way that, that, that I look at it, the way that, uh, you know, we discussed this over coffee this morning. So I guess the way that we look at it is we've got five stages that people go through. So stage one is to come and take a course with us and work towards getting your journeyman certification. Um, And that is something that goes along with the course and it proves that you have mastered the material and not everybody who comes on the courses achieves the certifications. And that was a decision we had to make a while back was, um, you know, does everybody get a trophy here? And then it doesn't mean anything or do we make it hard to get and then it means something. And we went with making it hard to get. So it means something. And I think currently we're at about maybe 30 percent of our students get the, maybe 25 ran the numbers on it. You ran like, the numbers the last time. The last time uh, last time we talked about it, I, I hate kind of around 30 or what it, as a thing. So I ran the numbers. It's about it's about like 28 to 29. So 28% of our students yeah. achieve the journeyman. And there are a lot of reasons for that. You know, number one, it's hard. Yeah. Uh, it's not something that's easy to do. It takes a lot of work. Um, and you have to progress to where you're going to get good at things. Right? It's not a sort of hand-holding sort of thing. But we've talked about it in the past. And yeah. I, I don't think we need to, to no. belabor too much speaking about the journeyman Um Step two, so you've got your journeyman certification. Step two, go take a medical course, right? Uh, First aid, CPR, we recommend people take a wilderness first responder course. Um, But the reason why you need to take a medical course is because you need a current first aid and CPR card in order to register to take the test to become a registered main guide. So that would be step three get a guide license in the state of Maine if this is where you're planning to do your guiding or instructing. Um, So once you have that, you've got a lot of the kind of paperwork stuff out of the way with the medical and getting a guide license. And they give you a cool patch that you can sit at the diner, drink coffee, and talk about how smart you are. Um, That's all we do. We don't even go to the diner. We just sit around (laughs) in here and talk about how smart we are while we wear our patches. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's the only thing that gets me up in the morning, really. I want them to come up with like a main guide patch that's also one of those fancy nicotine patches. Because it would be like getting two birds stoned at the same time. <laughs> uh, I don't know if... 
I, anyway, yeah. <laughs> once you achieve your guide license, uh, you're up to step four, which is to start going on expeditions. We've got a kind of a rough outline of the trips that we like people to have done if they want to be guiding with us, and it's the trips that we're going to go do. So for us, you know, probably a, an Aroostook trip, an Allagash trip, if it's in the springtime, maybe a St. John trip. But getting out there where there's no like instructor or no head guide that you can bounce every idea off and double check everything, getting out there where you have to be the person making the decisions and you have to live with the outcomes of those, those decisions. That's a huge step in the progression of somebody who's going from uh, basically student to person in charge or guide. So yeah, being out and doing it on the trail. Um, and there's step four. Step five is to have a experience um, with a primitive living practicum. And we used to try to organize those each summer. Uh, we sort of got away from it, but we're, we're always there to help out students who want to have that experience. But to pick a level of technology and to go live with it for a couple of weeks, you know, two to three weeks, probably minimum. So it's one thing to, to get your 25 Bodril fires for your journeyman cert. And then, uh, so you get your 25th Bodril fire and put it down and then get a match to go light the fire to cook dinner with. It's a whole different animal when those things are being used as part of your daily life skills. So you're not going to light a fire with a match. You're going to do every fire for a couple of weeks with the friction. So by living with those technologies, that's where you really come to, I don't want to say master it, but that's where you really come to have an appreciation for it and what it can do for you to really, to really know it on a deep level. Yeah, and the the people that I mean, uh, when we're looking, you know, we said at the beginning of this that the first step is to come and take a course with us, and that's not that's not like a marketing thing. It's just that the people that we're looking for also there's a very specific personality that fits into this kind of job of living with this every day, and I mean, and part of it is they kind of have to get along with us, right? Like, which is hard, like real hard. It's really hard. Um, but so, but the other it's thing is hard. <laughs> it's uh, it's a challenge. Um, but the other side of that is that you're also, when students are there, you're looking for people with like, with that kind of drive and grit to take it past where, to take it past that minimum. Um, cause the journeyman is hard to get, but if somebody gets that journeyman and then still is hungry for more, that's a person that I want to work with. Right. I don't want somebody that just does as little as they the can bare do. Minimum. Cause you and I already do the bare minimum, so we don't need a third one. Right. Heavyweight, heavyweight, <laughs> heavyweight, heavyweight. <laughs> Um, the bare necessities. What? <laughs> Arena. I have movie? totally forgotten about my worries and my strife. <laughs> but no, it's true. It's uh, there's a because um, that is the other side of this, right? Is that you're looking for uh, you're looking for a certain personality that can kind of put up with the rigors of this. Nine weeks is a long time to be up here, right? It is and, a long time, and the <laughs> it, you know you've heard us say it before. The longer the program, the more intense the program, the more remote the program, the more important soft skills or people yeah. skills are. And, and you know, you can study those. I don't know if you can teach them. Maybe you can. I don't, I mean, you can get better at them, but if someone has like zero soft <laughs> skills, zero people skills, and then thinks that this would be a good industry for them, prob probably not a great fit. You know, like soft skills are, are really everything. Yeah, because you mentioned it earlier, right? The, uh, the this is kind of a quote unquote cool job but it's also it, it looks cool from the outside but like on in the day-to-day -day basis you're kind of in the service industry you're like definitely you are, in the service you are industry providing a service with a smile um as often as you can um i'm it would be curious to hear so b is uh i also was a ta and i remember that uh <laughs> i remember you know living up with the students and being with them one-on-one -on -one is a it's a challenging thing because you're you're, <laughs> that it is. you're 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 part of the group, but you're also kind of apart from it at the same time. And so it's a great learning experience because you're kind of figuring out your approach to uh, your approach to dealing with the daily ins and outs. But you're also just kind of like learning how to like sometimes bite your lip and just kind of put on a put on a brave face. And it's a hard th even even the groups we have up here are great. But even with a great group, you some days are just you just don't want to deal with it. And I'd be curious to hear what you learned about like your, your internal workings with that. So it's definitely, it's definitely a learning process because <laughs> there's a bunch of people I've never met before, all different walks of life. And like, you know, 
they all come off a certain way. You got to learn the new people and then they come up to you and ask questions. So it's like, well, all right, well, how do I help? You know, um, it's definitely, I don't know how to put it. It's, it was hard at first. And then like, once you start getting used to it, like you figure out what each person, how they learn or how, um, what tips work better for them if you have to actually show them or if they get it just by explaining it you every person learns differently so it's weird trying to you know f trying to read people to find out how they learn so you can help them better yeah pay close attention to what he just said that's yeah. the instructor training process in a nutshell yeah is being able to work with people meet with them where they're at and help them to progress further right like that's that's it that there's 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 nothing else really yeah, like no. that really is it <laughs> no the you know we said it before but the, the hard skills and like the actual like things you need to live up here are the easy part the hard part about being the instructor is kind of that that back end stuff the 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 planning at night and the the interactions with your students and that's something um you know we said earlier we think we we think we train the best people up here and i i think one of the reasons is that um, people that start to work with us get get the opportunity to day in day out work on those soft skills and kind of I we always I always in my head phrase it as finding finding your voice as an instructor. Um, you know we've talked about it before. Tim and I have very different group management styles, and um, it took me it took me probably two years to realize that I could do it differently than Tim did, and that was okay. And I wouldn't have figured that out if I had just been coming out every weekend and kind of following Tim's lead. It takes it takes having that on the on the ground moments of kind of trying different stuff and realizing, oh, okay, this this does work as well. It's just and that that's the most valuable thing I think for me as a TA that I got was kind of feeling out that those different approaches and um, and getting the chance to experiment with that in a way where there was backup. Um, yeah, know. being able to experiment. It's like going on expeditions with a with a group of people. Yeah. You know, sometimes we want to have the solo experience, but we go because of the safety that the other people give us. So, you know, the idea behind the, the teaching assistant or TA program here um, has always been to provide that safe space where people can find their voice and get that everyday experience of, hey, you know, I working in this industry, working in this field every day, day after day. Um, and that's you know, that's why, again, I, I think we train the best in the industry because of all that day to day to day experience they have that, you know, when they leave here at the end of the semester that they've solved a lot of problems, you know, like you've solved a lot of problems and, and help people <laughs> through a lot of sticky situations. And that sort of training is invaluable. So then later on, if you're out running your own program, guiding your own trip, you've got that big, vast uh experience that you can draw on mm -hmm. you know like it's less scary when you've been there and done that so yeah and i and, you know and we were talking about this before before the podcast but um i think that it's it's kind of important to say that when we talk about training the best in the industry i think that's not i mean i think that we do but i think that it's also something that we kind of think of as like that's our benchmark for people that come that's what we're aiming for um, is having people come out of here being being in the top the top ten percent of people that are working in this industry, and it's it keeps us from I mean at, at least for me it keeps us kind of from slacking on some of the stuff, and it also just continues to uh, to drive me right because I've been doing this for a little while now, and it's easy to kind of I'm starting to get to the stage where I can you know I can phone in a lesson if I need to, but I think understanding that people are coming up here with that as what we've what we've offered them is being trained to be the best and if i if i phone a lesson in i'm not doing i'm not i'm doing a disservice to those people that came up so well, it keeps yeah. us honest as well i i mean i think what you're talking about is standards yes you know having a standard which and, i don't and that's the uh <laughs> like the whole bit with the journeyman is right being able to perform at a certain level or at a standard of skill and expertise through benchmarks, through testing, practical exams in the field, through doing academic background research. Like, yes, if you're going to carry that journeyman certification, you know, you've got to prove it, prove that you have it, prove that you've internalized it. And that's kind of the idea that uh, the standards that we hold people to are pretty high. Yeah. And it's why, you know, we, uh, 
It's why we think it takes about two years for someone to be able to r help run a long-term course. With, because, with us. With us, yeah. Because yeah. it's just, um, you need you need at least two cycles through kind of the season and the rhythms of what goes on, not just in like the course itself, but in the natural world. Like you need to see everything twice, like all the plants, you need to see those, um, you need to see them in all their phases as they're growing and then as they're dying and no, be able to ID those no matter the time of the year. You need to understand the differences of winter versus summer stuff. You need to be able to manage all that stuff as it happens. Um, and you just you wouldn't get it from only seeing one one fourth of the year, you know. Yeah, and I think you also don't get it just from taking a course no, without no, a no. lot of background study and self study. Yeah. That we've all probably seen those things where come and take our instructor development course. It's like two days, or maybe it's like four days spread over a month or two. And you know how much usable stuff do you really get out of two days? You know what I mean. Whereas. Uh, you know, if you think about it, that you've got your face time when you're in the class for two days, but maybe then you've got the rest of the month to work on specific things while you're out. Um, and yeah, I think that's what Christopher's getting at when he says it takes two years because yeah. it's a process. It's, you know, there's that old that old rag about the I think Malcolm Gladwell wrote about it, but the ten ten thousand hours mm. uh, leads to mastery. Um, and uh, I don't know how many hours are in two years, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. Well, it takes a long oh, time. Yeah. Well, I'd be curious with with you, B, because you were a student in the spring, um, and that in that as a student, you're learning all the skills, and then when you come up here, um, you're getting the chance to kind of live with them day in and day out. And I'd be really curious to hear, you know, what what growth you had over. You know, we're almost done with the fall now. So yeah. You've been up here for half a year essentially and, uh, <laughs> yeah. isn't that weird yeah um, but yeah so i'd be curious to see what uh what kind of like not so much the interpersonal stuff but with the actual skills themselves what kind of like jumps happened just from the just from the nature of living with something you already knew so like the the benchmarks for me like i'll call them benchmarks like noticing the changes and stuff um walking around pretty much anywhere like a lot of the wildlife that i didn't even know like or plant life like literally didn't know it existed more or less and now i'm seeing it in a whole nother you know the next uh season for the plant growth so now they're all dying and they're changing um being able to still identify and like walk through the woods like hey i can identify like seven plants right now in these 10 minutes it's it's a pretty neat thing to happen it's like self-growth that kind of gives you some confidence in life and living every day like going to get wood i mean my axe works definitely something that's enhanced you know i mean i'll call myself like an axeman prior to this but like i feel way safer i don't have to think about things that much it's just it's becoming second nature and cooking out here is great over an open fire <laughs> that was kind of your deal from the get-go though <laughs> that's great be at <laughs> the spring semester be uh we were we were every meal we cooked bees would be like this extravagant like four course meal where he was cooking like a pork roast for the next day's lunch in duck fat in duck fat <laughs> and, and everyone else at lunch is eating like cold cheese tortillas and we look over and bees got a thermos with steam coming out of it that smells like grandma's homemade soup he's a bit of an artiste it's pretty amazing it's pretty impressive um but yeah, so I'm glad to hear that you're improving even more. And I think what I've just taken away from that is uh, I'm not going to cook at all on our next trip. I'm just going to sit back and see what you come up with. So when B eventually hangs his shingle and uh, you have the opportunity to go on an expedition with him, do so and you will eat very well. Yeah, yeah. most likely. It won't be much of an expedition because you'll eat and then you'll just be like, can we just stay here? I don't feel like moving. <laughs> yep. Cook. Somebody roll me into my tent. <laughs> roll me into my tent, roll me back out in the morning, and then put me back in there. Yeah, exactly. Um. Yeah, so uh, we should talk a little bit about uh, the the kind of the insight from working with um, – working with people that have been doing it in the industry um, because that's kind of – you know, that's that safety net we were talking about earlier is that uh, – you know, if, if someone's going to be a TA, they, they obviously have a ton of stuff cut out for them during the course, but 
it's it's not a it's not a like you come up and work for nothing like the thing you're getting in trade is having the insight from you know i would say mostly from tim but i've been up here a little while and can kind of <laughs> muddle my way through certain things that come up but i think that that's an important part as well that people get from working through our working through our program is that you know there's between tim and i there's geez 30 years of experience ish coming up on i can't we we've established Jeez. that we we've, we've established that we can't <laughs> add right um but there's there's a lot going on and that's kind of that's kind of the thing that um that i think the ta program is mostly about is seeing the back end stuff seeing the what goes into planning a day how you're managing the little weird things that come up every day and or a trip as well yeah managing mm. a trip as well and being able to being able to go on that trip and kind of be part of the leadership team and see how decisions are made and stuff like that, rather than just being kind of along for the ride is a huge thing. So I'd be curious what your kind of, that sort of sounds like I'm being like, tell me how great we are. And that's <laughs> no. not what I'm doing. Like, I'm curious about your kind of what, like the back end stuff have you seen that was kind of insightful? Okay. So like <clears throat> for me, like to like have you guys, as you guys talked about, like kind of like a safety net and stuff. Um, I, didn't really do too much of the, you know, speaking out and like teaching this time, but just because I was trying to watch a little bit and learn less about the other things, um, because I basically just learned about them, you know what I mean? So like I could actually take time and actually watch and see how things happen and, um, like seeing the thought process that you guys have for the day is like, well, if it does change a little bit, like what else can we do? We need to like think about other things to do. Say you have one task. Now you're going to plan a few things that way, whatever it seems the crowd is leaning towards, we can do that. And it's that kind of prior thought that, you know, you can't just go into the day and say, Hey, all right, today we're going to, you got to think about that. There's, I mean, you have to have the day's plan. Yeah. You can't just walk into it. So it's kind of cool to see how there's always a plan, different options of things to do. Um, and seeing the other side of this, like the actual, like the little I've seen so far is like marketing stuff like that, like how to get your name out. It's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of work, you know, like you didn't <laughs> think about prior Yeah. and it's like, Oh, I'm just going to go teach people to swing axes. Well, yeah. How are you going to get those people? Yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot more in depth. Um, I'm kind of. Happy, I'm really happy to be here. Trust <laughs> yeah. me. In a in a nutshell, though, like kind of the the way that we describe coming and staying at the field school is stepping into functioning systems. Yeah. So mm, systems yeah. that are already functioning, and I think the TA program and the instructor development program is the same thing. Where you're, you know, uh, we might not have the greatest systems in the world, but they've been working for us for over two decades now. So you know, I'm not claiming that our systems are fantastic, but they work. And the, the, you know, the kind of the, the beauty of the TA position is that you get to step into not only the camp systems of, say, like composting and cooking and fire mm -hmm. and how we manage all that, but you get to look into the business systems, you know, step into something. How do you market? How do you get the word out? How do you do your course planning? How do you do lesson prep? How do you do all those things? How do you manage an, an expedition? So, you know, being able to step into something that's functioning and derive as much, uh, insight as you can from that i think that's a that's a benefit yeah, and i think we valuable. were sort of tiptoeing around that but we never really like said yeah. it so you know stepping into functioning systems. Yeah, yeah yeah of course i can definitely say that's a that's definitely a thing um thanks for putting that up so i could say it differently it's like what i take for granted up at camp or like what we're doing for the day i take for granted but really it's just a system i've been using for almost half a year now <laughs> and like it's kind of cool to see it from this side and watching it actually happen and like follow through yeah i i mean i recently started running programs down in vermont and the, the systems the systems like the physical systems are not in place yet so i was working through the process of building those while i was there and it was a it made me really appreciate how like it's, it's almost like clockwork up here almost as long as everything's run right everything is just it just functions mm -hmm. um and then i i just as i was working through it and thinking about like going through the stages that like essentially everything that we set up like here is like how can it go wrong how do we avoid it going wrong um so getting to kind of 
work through that on my own made me really appreciate the last five years of like seeing how seeing how the the calamities were avoided right and being able to jump ahead with that right from the get-go rather than having to have some horrible experience with the <laughs> composting toilets you know i got to i got to skip that part because i've been up here for five years seeing seeing how well managed they are um so that's that's a super important thing to take away from the process i think is all of that well you just weren't here when the calamities were taking place. I know. I was, that's what I mean. That's what I it's mean. The beauty of time. I got, I got to skip. I got to skip them and come in. Come in on the tail end of it. But don't worry. I'm sure. I'm sure I will have some calamities down there because yeah. I am not a clever man. I'll miss something, and then I'm going to walk out to uh, a raccoon who's decided he's just made his. He's just found his best day ever, and I'm going to have to deal with that. That is, though, I mean, you say that jokingly, but that's how you build your systems, yeah. is you, you get an idea, you try it, and then you kind of clean up the mess that you make, and you say, oh, okay, if we do this again, we got to change A, B, and C. Actually, so I have a good I have a good little sort of anecdote about that, is that, um, so the place that I'm running programs in Vermont is at, at my home, um, but out in we have a couple of acres and out out in the kind of the woods where we're running it is there's a big kind of it's not a far hike, but there's a big ravine you got to go down into and back up. And uh, so I just was hauling water jugs out the whole weekend that people were there. And so my, in my head, I'm trying to figure out a way to get to get water out there more easily. And the first thing I thought of genuinely, genuinely jetpack zip line zip in line. my head, I was like, if I run a zip line across, <laughs> then I just have to hike them up to the top of the thing and hook them onto it and push. I'll just, I'll just have a rope tied to it. And I can just pull it across. Well, if you have and the then, helicopter, fly then, them up to the top. And then, exactly. Right. <laughs> like, I went with the most complicated version of this. And then, and then my lovely girlfriend was like, why don't we just run a hose, a really Same long thing. hose out to there and in my head, I was like, I am the stupidest human being. See, <laughs> on the one ever... hand, hose. On the other hand, anti-gravity exactly, machine. Exactly, exactly. Like it just, <laughs> and, and, but those little things, like it, it, until that system is worked out, you're going to go through a lot of variations that are pretty, I still want to build a zip line. I think it would work. Um, but what you're describing is the benefit of spending right. time with someone with years of experience because they've probably made most right. of those. Yeah. Like, did you ever try to build a zip line to transport water, Tim? No. Well, see, you see what I missed out on. If you had tried, I just learned what a zip line was when you started talking about it. <laughs> I was thinking zip ties, and I was like, "How are those going to get water up a hill?" I was like, "I don't know. I'm just better to sit here quietly and <laughs> look like an idiot than open my mouth and erase all doubt." <laughs> that's a good line. I like that. But yeah, that kind of stuff. That that's that's kind of. You avoid a lot of those by being up here for a little while and seeing systems. Yeah, or or you know studying with some other person. You yeah. know, if you're listening to this and you're nowhere near Maine, yeah, someone else who's been doing it a while in your neighborhood. Like, yeah. there's huge benefits. You'll get tons of insights. Yeah, we don't we don't we don't corner the market on systems. There's a lot of people that run things. Oh like yeah, well. definitely. But there's just huge benefit if you're a young person interested in entering this industry to go and study with somebody who has been doing it for a while and has developed their systems. Yeah. And then, you know, you sort of you take what works for you from that and you can leave the rest out there. And, you know, hopefully through the process of evolution, eventually all the systems everywhere will be perfect. Yeah, it's worked out really good for us so far as a species. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, are well, we done? Yeah, are you we got done? anything else to add, B? Any other insight from the course? I mean, it's fun and it's work. It's <laughs> definitely work. If you ever plan on going into this, don't don't forget that. I mean, like... You mean it's not just sports cars and cashing million-dollar checks? Never. I have not gotten <laughs> one sports car, and I'm really upset. Well, it's because it's because you got to build the Flintstones car <laughs> and run it with your feet. Next trip to town, we're getting him like a little uh, Matchbox sports car. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for spending this time with us, kind of rambling away on a rainy day. Um, you know the drill. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with somebody. Leave us a review. You know, one of those things help us spread the word about it. Um, and we've got to get, uh, we've got to wrap this up cause we've got a big, uh, chicken dinner to go eat. I completely forgot about that. Yeah. It's also, we should also say that we have a giant chicken dinner to go. It's 1 PM. 
It's 1 yes. p.m. It's 1 p.m. And well, we're dinner. Eat. Dinner is the midday meal, and then supper is the evening meal. I never, under, I will never understand the Yankees. There was a well, there was a summer camp down the from the road from me as a kid, and they had breakfast, dinner, and supper. So in some things, dinner is the midday meal, not lunch. They would call it what is normally known as lunch. It? They would call it dinner. Yes. I don't know where it came from. It's probably like an old English boarding school tradition. Anyway, so yes, we are late for dinner, the midday meal. <laughs> all right let's wrap this up this is thank you good. for listening have a great day we'll talk to you later you have been listening to the jack mountain bushcraft podcast for more information on our professional wilderness guide training programs that are college accredited and gi bill approved visit us on the web at jackmtn.com.